So before I'm able to introduce what this new structure a heap is that's going to implement this ADT for us, I want us to do a little bit of a review of our tree terminology. So, you know, last week we talked all about trees, but I want to highlight that there is a subtle difference between the invariants we've been using. So a tree is a generic concept of nodes that have um, relations to other nodes in a very specific way. We'll actually see that a tree is um, a special case of this graph thing we'll introduce later in the quarter. But a binary tree is just any tree that has at most two children. There is no requirement in a binary tree of where the data is located or how tall the tree is, um, or like that, that it's balanced any, anyway. We added an invariant on our binary tree called the binary search tree invariant, which then made it a binary search tree which requires this sorted property that for every node with a key K, the left subtree only has keys smaller than that key K and the right subtree has keys that are greater than K. So it added this sortedness property to our binary tree. We added an additional requirement with the AVL invariant that yielded an AVL tree, which says that this tree has to be roughly balanced. But, um, as a reminder, all of these extra things, binary search tree invariant, the AVL invariant, those are additions on this plain old binary tree. And so we'll see that this structure that we're going to talk about is just a different take on invariants that you could place on a binary tree. So what I'm going to introduce to us is this structure called a heap. A heap is a special type of tree with a slightly different set of invariants. A heap's intuition of why we're going to change this invariant up is in the binary search tree, we organize the data such that we could find any value in the tree quickly, right? You could go left or right, and it helps you go down the right path. And we added the AVL invariant to make sure that the height wasn't too tall. But the BST was optimized such that if you found any value, you'd have a quick runtime. But what we're, it seems that we care about in some sense for this prior to queue application is we really want fast access to the smallest thing, so we could quickly peek at it or quickly remove it. So we're gonna change up our invariant um, so that uh, we could structure it in this more useful way. As a note, this heap invariant we're about to introduce has nothing to do with binary search trees. We're gonna remove the binary search tree invariant, the AVL invariant, we're just working with plain old trees. So the intuition of what this heap structure is gonna look like is think of it like a pile of laundry. If you're a, person that piles laundry type of person, you know that there's secretly structure in there. The things that you don't want to wear go at the bottom. The things that you wear more often go at the top. So even in things that look random or look unordered, there can be ordered. So here's the heap invariant. Instead of having the super nice structure of left is less than, right is greater than, we're going to have a much simpler, a much looser invariant. Every node is less than or equal to all of its children. It's kind of weird. It's probably not clear how this is going to help us quite yet, but this is going to allow us to have trees that are ordered in a different way than a binary search tree. So for example, this heap is a tree that, has, that follows the heap invariant. Every node is less than or equal to all of its children. So for example, four is less than both of its children, six and five. The six's children, eight and 373, are greater than six, or another way of saying that is six is less than or equal to all of its children. Same thing with five having a child of seven. Now, the reason this heap invariant is useful is because now it's really easy to peek. Because if your tree follows this invariant, the smallest value by definition has to be the root node. So it has to be the thing on the top. And so since we store our tree with a reference to the root, you always have instant access to it. So it's super, super easy to peek now. Now, the question is, is this the only invariant we need? Do we need any other invariants to help us make a structure that's efficient? It's not quite clear yet because I haven't quite told us how we're going to use these heaps to implement everything else efficiently, like add and remove min. But it turns out we're going to need one other invariant because there are lots of heaps that are valid that aren't actually useful or not going to be efficient. Just like with the degenerate binary search tree, we could still end up with degenerate heaps. And we want, um, we're going to want to make sure that we still limit the height of our tree, the height of our heap, so that we can have efficient runtimes everywhere else. So we're going to see we need actually one more invariant. 
that is an invariant on the structure of how tall this tree can be. So we could still get these degenerate trees, even our heaps. And we saw, you know, thinking back to last week, that when we want to make sure our operations are efficient, it's usually all about limiting the height of the tree. So that if you ever have to search down for a value, you know you don't have to go too far. Now, AVL was actually really tricky to come up with an invariant for, because that binary search tree invariant was really, really strict, right? When everything, uh, when it had that recursive uh, definition where it said like, this value had to be less than the, uh, all the values to the left have to be less than the root, all the values to the right have to be greater than the root, and that applies for each node going the way down. And that super um, strict ordering invariant actually made it really hard for us to come up with a perfectly balanced binary search tree, right? We saw that trying to enforce exactly balanced just kind of doesn't quite work there. And so we had to allow some leniency. It turns out because this heap invariant is so loose, right? Just that each node is less than or equal to its children, we can actually put a much stricter uh, structure invariant on our heaps. So we're gonna introduce the heap structure invariant which is a heap must also always be a complete tree. We haven't seen this word complete yet, so let me show you an example. A, complete, a tree is complete if every single row is completely full, meaning there are no nulls kind of in the tree, except the last row. The last row is allowed to have nulls, but it must be filled from left to right. So you kind of have to imagine that like every row of the tree is full, except the last node where all of the non-null nodes are on the left. So here are examples of one tree that meets this heap structure inv invariant and one that doesn't. The, the, heap, uh, the tree on the left meets this heap structure invariant. It's full, or sorry, it, I should say the word is complete. Um, it's complete because each row is completely full, one node, two nodes, but that last layer um, is allowed to have some empty spots all the non-empty spots have to be the leftmost spots. And so this, that example on the left does meet this heap structure invariant. But that tree on the right, even though it meets the heap invariant, the ordering of the, uh, the values, four is at the top, six and five are above eight and nine, it doesn't meet this heap structure invariant because it's not complete. Why is it not complete? Well, it has some missing nodes in that last, those nulls in that last row. Um, all of the, uh, they aren't all at the end. So all of the non-null nodes have to be in the leftmost in that last row. So that's an example of a, a tree that is, does not meet this heap structure invariant. So let's talk a bit about the specific application of these heaps. So this, uh, what we're gonna be calling these binary heaps, I'll explain this in one second. And we'll talk about how these invariants play out in the structure. So one thing that's usually a bit weird when we talk about heap implementations is there's lots of rooms to make choices on how you represent this data, what values are returning. And so you usually see these heap structures qualified with a lot of adjectives. So for example, the structure that we're going to most commonly talk about is called a binary heap. And a binary heap is pretty much exactly what I've just been describing this whole time. It's a binary tree that has these heap invariants. You can imagine, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, you could theoretically have heaps that have three children or four children per node, but those wouldn't be a binary heap. So we're gonna really focus on this binary heap case uh, for now. So a binary heap is a binary tree with the heap invariants. And notice this does not make it a binary search tree because it does not have that BST invariant. A binary heap has these three invariants. The binary tree invariant, every node has at most two children. The heap invariant, every node is less than or equal to all of its children, and the heap structure invariant. It's always a complete tree. So here I have some examples of trees that may or may not be binary heaps. So for example, this note tree here is going to end up being a binary heap. Why? Well, it's a binary tree. Each node has at most two children. Does it meet our heap invariant? Well, eight is less than or equal to its children, nine and 10. So it does meet that. And does it meet the heap structure invariant? Yes, it's a complete tree. It's completely full, so that's good. This next one, similarly, also meets all three of those invariants. One is less than two and three. Two is less than or equal to nine and four. Three is less than or equal to six and seven. And it's a complete tree, so we're all good. 
This last one, though, is not a binary heap. Why is it not a binary heap? Well, it's not definitely not complete, right? Uh, that two node right here has a, a null child, even though it has other children that aren't null, and these nulls appear kind of in the middle of the tree. So remember, a complete tree is full row to row, except that last row, and all the nulls end up being at the end, okay? So now that I've talked about this, let's practice this a little bit. Here are three trees. I want you to tell me which one of these are valid binary heaps. This could be a multiple answer question. Uh, the one on the left is heap one or tree one. The second one's tree two. The third one's tree three. Select all of them that are valid binary heaps. So take a second and practice this on your own. Okay, so hopefully you had some time to do that. So this first tree on the left is not going to be a binary heap. Why? Well, it's not a complete tree. Additionally, it also violates the heap invariant. Notice the top node 4 is greater than its child 2. So remember, the heap invariant says you always have to be less than or equal to your children. So because we violated that, we violated two things here. First, that heap invariant, and then also the heap structure invariant. So this is definitely not a binary heap. What about the second tree? The second tree also is not going to be a binary heap because it's not complete. It's kind of this degenerate uh, case, and we are not going to allow that in our binary heap because it's not complete. Additionally, it also violates that heap invariant because that seven node has a child that's six. Seven is not less than or equal to six, so this invariant has been uh, invalidated. And it turns out our last tree here is going to be a valid binary heap. It's a binary tree. It has our heap invariant. Each node is less than or equal to its children, and it's complete. Notice that it's oops. Notice that its only null element is kind of this last child on the right. So it is totally okay to have nulls as long as they're in the last row, um, and they are kind of the rightmost thing. So all the non-null nodes are on the left side. So this is totally a valid heap. Now, why does this heap? Why do these invariants help? It turns out when you're using a binary heap and you're meeting all these invariants, including that heap structure invariant, because remember, binary heaps have to have this, that invariant, it turns out that the height is going to be theta log n because that tree is a complete tree. It's, I can't prove this to you, but with the uh, structure of the tree, knowing it's complete, one thing you can imagine if we were doing proofs in this class, you could prove the fact that all complete trees with n nodes have height at most log n. And it, you, the intuition for this is in some sense, it's kind of similar to the argument about why AVL ends up making our, our trees logarithmic height, which we didn't actually argue. But this is actually a stronger argument, a stronger uh, invariant here of structure of having a complete tree. So it's definitely going to have this log n behavior. And so this means um, implementing uh, methods that might have to run down to the bottom of the tree, they're definitely going to have a logarithmic runtime because they're going to enjoy this um, uh, just going down the tree. In our next video, now that we've talked about what this binary heap is, what invariance it has, we'll actually talk explicitly about how do I actually implement the methods that our priority queue ADT needs. So how do I use this structure in our priority queue? Because remember, this is an implementation, but we haven't necessarily tied it to how does it become a priority queue, but that is our next video.